Hey everybody, I, we're back. Now, I think I just managed to post that uh, chat with Curtis. So now, I'm hoping, Curtis, if, you're, if you can see me, I'm hoping that you'll come back on. Because um, we were just getting to a spot there. We were getting to a very good spot. Let's hope. Uh, yeah, da, da, da. I don't see him. So Curtis, if you're listening, you you just you kind of request to join back on, and hopefully it'll. Uh... Okay, hey Donald. Okay, uh, we'll wait. But Curtis, we were talking. We were we were we were talking about uh, history, and we were talking about Curtis's grand Curtis's. <laughs> Grandfather was the first successful cesarean birth in America, which was which was in kind of an incredible story. And um, we uh, now hopefully I can uh, we hopefully we can get him back on. We can c- continue the conversation. Hello, everybody. Um, bonjour. Uh, yeah, start playing a song and he'll be back. You're you're absolutely right. Connection recorded. Insightful questions and answers. We'd love to hear. Yeah, me too. I'd love to hear an uninterrupted conversation. Hi, Kess. Somebody says, hello, Kess. Come and say hello. Come and say hello to everybody. Hello. Hello. <laughs> She's, uh... Curtis, are you there? Let me know if you, uh, if you show up. I hope you do. Curtis. Okay, now I see some names coming true. Sliphorn. So now, let's hope we can continue here. Uh, you're back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, Curtis. While we have a while we have a fairly decent connection, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions from some of the people who've tuned in. Okay. Uh, like I was just basically making before we got we cut off that we've travelled the world together in in our band, yeah. and we've travelled America together. And one of the questions that came in was from Mark Geary, who's a songwriter who's also travelled an awful lot. Yeah, Mark. You know Mark, of course. Yeah. yeah. And we're in touch. Oh, good, good. Yeah. Mark asked me, uh, is there any parts of America that, that you don't necessarily look forward to traveling to? And he's, he's talking in ref- he was talking in reference to that film, that wonderful movie that came out recently, The Green Book. I really enjoyed it. Don Shirley? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if there's any parts of the world that you don't necessarily... I mean, I, I, you know, I've got a memory of us on a train in Russia, uh, which, which, was, which got kind of hairy. Uh, but we, we, you know, we had a great time, and Russia is an amazing place to go play. And the Russians were so great to us. But we did have a, a hairy moment with a, a kind of a racist guy on on the train, um, which was kind yeah. of. Oh, the guy was a sniper. That's what I was told. At least. Well, you know, and I and I had to, uh, I had to, as my girlfriend uh, Hedy at the time was, she was. Uh, she going for a man. She's Czech, and the Czechs have a, you know, they, they 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 can they can they can get a bit angry with the Russians, and so she was really going for him, and he was he was getting a bit touchy, and so we all had to run, and we were just hoping you didn't show. Um, I know the friend when he came back to the uh, the bunk area, he was telling me don't don't go out don't go out to the uh, what is it, the the bar or whatever that was, <laughs> and you know I I, I took heed. Fair enough. And we, look, we had a great time in Russia. I don't, I don't want to sort of, talk with one, but we had a, we had a great time over there. But that, yeah. Uh, but then, is there any? So, is there any? Any is, is where you don't necessarily love? Well, it's funny. I remember when, um, uh, when I was in my twenties, I was playing on the, the West Indian Calypso circuit, and uh, he's actually the probably one of the most well-known um, artists, Mighty Sparrow. I don't know if you remember his name. So we were coming into Boston, we were driving in, and we pull up into to a gas station. Unbeknownst to us, it's in the south side of Boston. And this is during the 70s. 
And while we're getting gas, somebody just drives by and throws something at us. Like they stop their bike and throw something. At us. And then it's like, whoa, what's going on, you know? And the guy I was riding with was uh, from the uh, Caribbean, very intense fella. He didn't really know where we were either, but we were like being kind of taken on by like anybody that saw us kind of had a response. It was like, oh, wow, let's get out of here. So we got the gas and left. And that, that left an impression of Boston on me. But after uh, working at the circus and going to Boston, you know, it was a, it was a it changed for me. I, I didn't have the same feeling, but I know that particular time in that area of South Boston, it was, it was very very intense. Um, Heavy feeling. You know, yeah, yeah. So Boston was the one that I first recalled traveling to and saying, "Wow, this is you know this is surprised. friendly to us." Yeah, well, I was really uh, surprised. We had a day off in uh, in California. We were traveling down from, we had just played San Francisco and we were coming down to Los Angeles and we had a day off in between. Uh, and I was really surprised. We had a day off in, in, in a town near Mendocino. It was near Mendocino, it wasn't Mendocino. And I remember, and I hope Earl doesn't mind me, me saying this, but Earl, our drummer, I remember him sort of, and, like, as, oh, okay. You know, he was just a bit free. I mean, because I, I remember going out for a walk and I, I remember the place feeling, I can't remember the name of the town, but I remember it kind of heavy, you know, there was a sort of a heaviness. I remember, uh, you know, Pearl saying, I'm not even going to go into town, you know, because I don't like this. Earl, he's lived in uh, California, but mainly in LA, right, I think. Yeah, I think he lived in L.A., but I, I remember he talked about this one particular town. Like, speaking for Earl, Earl, Earl would know better than I would, but, but I just remember it's the only time I've, I, I was actually surprised. Cause I would have thought California was really liberal, but he was like, man, was, he said that was a heavy town, you know, because I think he may have had some had experience there from before, you know. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, it was Reagan country for a while there. Yeah. You know, Southern Cal. Yeah. That it, so there is definitely elements, but um, yeah, I, I agree. I find to, you know California even travel is like from from a very cool hippie vibe to uh, you know lefty, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'd say, and, and I thinking about other places. Well, some places I expect to certain uh, kind of encounters. And when they don't occur, I'm kind of surprised. Like, you know, when you go out, well, Iowa, but I didn't know about Iowa, you yeah. know. We were touring and we went, to, I know we spent a, a time in Iowa. Uh, I forgot which town it was. And they had a big, they have the town that has the uh, statue of uh, Bix Beiderbex, the trumpet player from uh, the jazz scene in the 30s and 40s. And, you know, I was like, I think it was Ames, Iowa, or something right. like that. Hey, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the South, of course, I remember stopping there when we were traveling with uh, the uh, jazz, uh, Kansas, uh, the Robert Altman movie, and they had the band, you know, uh, we were on tour, and we stopped in Alabama at this uh, rest stop. And uh, so the guys, like, you know, tooling in and out, jazz musicians, you know, these guys. And the guys that are in there are also getting some stuff. And they had camouflage stuff on there, like camouflage gear. And they were saying, uh, one guy to the other when they were leaving, let's go kill something. Oh. Uh, so, oh. Ooh, ouch. <laughs> I think they were, they were just going hunting, but, you know, it was like, yeah. let's yeah. go kill something. But there are some for people to hear, yeah. Yeah, yeah and it's loud enough for you to hear. Yeah. yeah. So. Good. Um, I never. Forget, we had an incredible night, Curtis. Uh, we were we were playing at a place called the Truman, and at the concert. I you guys, uh, you guys invited us there. You, you and Michael and uh, and Dave were going down to sit in at a Green Lady Lounge, and the whole band went with you. You know, so it was after the conversation, and 
we went down to the club and Earl, we had Earl Harvin on drums, uh, Carol on key, Michael Buckley on saxophone, Smith, and yourself on trombone. And I was so blown away by the guys that I play in a band. Seeing you guys do your thing, like play jazz. Because you guys play, a, you guys are playing my songs. And the arrangements you guys have put to my songs are, are incredible. And I've always felt like, wow, incredible. There's Mikko. Yeah, he was. And, and we, we stood in the bar. We stood in that bar. Got to watch shine. It really, truly blew my mind. You know, the real life. Yeah, I remember because because the people there that were playing, they were they turned out to be so warm towards us and so friendly, you know, and encouraging. Usually, sometimes you could fall into a piece and it's like, oh, these hot shotty guys trying to, you know. It was none of that. It was it was like lovely vibe. I thought, you know. Yeah. From, from the people. Forgot what what city was that? Oh, was man. oh yeah. Oh. No, I remember that. Man. It was. Yeah, amazing was time. Yeah, those tours had some great, great moments. You know, really, did. it really did. And and we miss you. And and someone was making the point earlier on how much we miss you. And you know, one of the things I'd love to talk about in regard to race and in regard to the whole thing about you know when we played together. Um, one of the things that really struck me about when you would step forward on the stage and you would sing "Wedding Ring" or you would play solos. One of the things that really always struck me about how the audience responded to you when you when you came to the center of the stage was that they could they got this because it would be very reductive to say you know yeah you know he's kind of the real deal or he's like he's the black guy and you know that he's like a little bit of the authentic but actually what yeah. it truly was certainly and certainly from where I see it now is you're a dyed-in-the-wool, older gentleman, jazz musician, have been, who've paid your dues all your life. You're the real thing. You know, you come out of a tradition of music that's, that goes back centuries now. You know, jazz music was born in the 19th century in New Orleans, and, and you're, you're part of a of a movement of music, you know, of course you play in my band, you know, you're playing these kind of popular songs with, with, with Guy, but actually when you step forward, I think people have a connection back into something much more. So, you know, I just wanted to, I, 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 I wonder, do you, did you, I wonder what kind of sense you got from, from, from our audience. Hey, Sam. Yeah, yeah. Well, there definitely is some of that, you know, element, um, especially since the musicians that you have assembled have so many of those connections. You know, of course, Michael, you know, his family connection is pretty deep. And, you know, uh, just communicating with them on and off the bandstand, you know, just made it more, first of all, comfortable for me. And I, I didn't feel like I was stepping out into, you know, uh, an evil mosh pit or something. <laughs> it was love, you know, and we would move to little areas like you would You would hint at some Prince, or you'd hint at some Marvin Gaye, and, you know, so it's kind of, the flavors were like, you know, were many, and they were being offered up to, I think most of the audiences loved it, I thought, you know. The, the stew that you brought to the uh, to the audiences like every night. It made me feel confident actually, because you know, we would go into these festivals and you know, large events is like, well, I, you know, I know we gonna kick some ass, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, you know, in all due respect to what you're doing, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, like I grew up a, a, a white kid, a working class kid in Dublin, and you know my my first introduction to black music uh i mean of course it would have been bob marley because marley was like the you know he was like a god of 
of my community. Like there was Bob Marley and there was Luke Kelly. Luke Kelly is a singer of a band called the Dubliners, which are like a, you know, Irish band, real working class singing, you know, incredible song. My introduction to, 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 to black music on a deeper level come through Brona Gallagher. Brona uh, was, was, in a, was, was, was a friend of mine and she was also with me in a film called The Commitments, which was a, you know, an Irish film, a, you know, a bunch of white kids solo music and you know i remember touring with with brona uh in like oh, yeah, brona. you know brona yeah she, from, from Derry, yeah. and brona was very yeah. very much connected with the civil rights movement um in the north of Ireland. you know very strong and grew up in the yeah. open yeah. all of that difficulty and you know and brona introduced me to the the last poets yeah. and Man, I was I was knocked out. Like, and she was listening to Ice T, listening to the Funk Eaters, you know. Uh, I, and for me, it was. And then, of course, there was Nina Simone, and you know, and then Curtis Mayfield. And Curtis was like this, like, blah, you know, just what a world. And and so Brona was really my, you know, Brona and and also then Dave were really my way into to the sort of deeper end of of soul music and what follows is jazz and and being on the road with you, you know, you've turned me on to some and the cannonball the you know, like the the the, the, the clone concert, um Keith Jarrett, uh, um who who, uh, who else now? Let me see. Uh Pharaoh Sanders, you know, like yeah. some of these incredible people that I've learned to through you um but but it's interesting that the commitments was that you know the civil rights movement and very much reflected the civil rights movement um in, you know in america in a, in a very different way of course uh mm -hmm. but uh i you know it's 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 very it's very interesting to me to hear about you know you know do, do you have hope for the do you have hope for the moment where Well, I know uh, it always reminds me of the Bill Fazell song called Look Out for Hope. You know, it's really, you got to look for it, that's for sure. It's not so evident right now because, uh, you know, I'm talking to people and I'm getting all, all sides of uh, the situation. Some people saying, look, well, you know, I may never play again. I may never do another show, you know, and people, you know, and other people are saying, well, wow, you know, I never even considered that. You know, but uh, but you know, given our reality, it's uh, it's definitely threatening and it's un it's unsettling. You know, I was just talking to my son about that because he's talking about trying to uh, face the realization like that we are gonna, we're going to be all our own producers and our own artists and our community of people are who we should be producing and 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 uh, kind of shaking up like the way things are being shaken shaking up now and i'm listening to a lot of young people and there's artists that are out there now that that are like friends of mine sons and you know next generation and they're speaking with different voices yeah you know uh, I've, I've met this young man named nick hakeem he's an interesting young fellow and he's doing doing some 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 good things, and we ask our old bodies up against some of his music, and uh, he appreciated it. So it's it's an interesting time. You're right. Yeah. Really, I don't know. I can't point to one direction and say that's where it's going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, you know, I think the whole civil rights movement right now is also is also uh, it's it's born out of you know, in a way, it's born out of the, of course, the uh, the systematic uh, violence against young black men in America by the police, which is just very, very obvious. You know, you look at how many people are incarcerated. You look at the numbers in prison. You look at the prison system. You look at the prison business. And right. it becomes very clear, you know. There's a wonderful book. I don't know if anyone wants a good book recommendation, but there's a wonderful book that I know you and I have spoken about, Curtis. 
Uh, and the, the book, I don't think the book title is very good, but the book is great. Uh, it's a book, the book called Gentrification of the Mind by Sarah Shulman. Uh, and mm. it, talked, it talked about the systematic removal of the black community from New York City. Uh, and it talked about push talked about, the, about when after the Second World War gave white uh, white ex um, soldiers you know mm -hmm. kind of a, a tax break on new houses uh, mm -hmm. outside of you know in Rochester or in you know Hudson or you know out, places outside of the city but then they realized after the 70s that the city was broke because in New York City had kind of ghetto if you like, you know, the term ghetto is a very political, word. the same way the mm -hmm. word famine is a political word. Um, but I just use it to describe the, what, what, how they, they um, and how they described it. And, and she talks about how the city fathers got together and basically came up with this. Uh, the title of the book is uh, Gentrification of the Mind. Um, and mm -hmm. how the city fathers would uh, got together and basically came up with this idea that they have to basically clear the city and start start attracting white folks back to the city and mm -hmm. and it, and part of that was the systematic harassment of of young black men who maybe got, got caught in a corner and joined and got put in prison so basically they basically harassed people out of the out of their neighborhoods and it's a interesting read, um, but but I, I like even 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 in modern day Bed Stuy, where you are in Brooklyn, Curtis. I know that people have been walking door to door offering to like to buy your house. Can you talk a little bit about that? Have you seen your neighborhood change? Oh, definitely. I, I don't have to look very far. I have to look to my next, look to my left, and uh, there's there's people. That, you know, uh, the houses are are. At this point, I don't know what's going to happen now with the economic, you know, situation. I'm curious to see what's going to happen with gentrification when people are out of jobs and uh, there's uh, no street, uh, you know, time without your mask on. You know, it doesn't make it so appealing from the gentrification side, I think. But yeah, uh, my neighbors to the next, to the left, they sold. The neighbor to the right just uh, sold her place. And, uh, you know, my son is doing real estate. So, I mean, the enormity of the, of the, uh, of the real estate prices now are really, you know, you, you, can, you can look at your, your, your friends and, and people that you uh, have history with, like in this, on this street, you know, my family was actually the first black family on the street. I didn't even, I found that out recently. Wow. Uh, so you're talking about, but you know, this, this is from the thirties, early thirties. So, but yeah, the gentrification in, in, in Bed-Stuy is, is, uh, is pretty intense, but I'm just curious to see what the next few months is, is going to hold because there were people leaving. I heard about people like those who can were getting out in the last month or so, if they had a town. Uh, they had a, a home in uh, Southampton or whatever. Uh, in fact, they were going to the point where Southampton, their rentals occupied by people that weren't going to leave. They, they, they didn't want to come back to the city because of what's going on with the virus. So this is an interesting. It's going to be interesting to see what, what happens. You know, people were the squatting neighbors, the big houses. They, they were squatting in Southampton. And, uh, you know, because they had no interest in going coming back into the city. And at the same time, they had the situation where the uh, Southampton land landlords were actually legally bound to have them. And they couldn't they couldn't uh, evict them. Yeah. Oh, so that's that gonna be a, it's gonna be you know so it's gonna be yeah you know. The Great Depression that might be down on us, I hate to say it. You know, that's going to, that'll change the face of a lot of uh, the gentrification that's going on in New York. Curious to see. They'll just be leaving the, uh, the Pulse 
you know, you know, see what happens then. It looks like, especially you know, you're talking about restaurants and businesses that may not be open again. You know. It's part of the lore of a gentrification, gentrification, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything that you... No, no, you did. I, I think that's really wonderful. Um, just for those who don't know what the Ham the South Hamptons, the Hamptons is like a, 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 a is a is a kind of a more up scale part of New York, right? Yeah, Montauk, the Hamptons, yeah. yeah, big houses. Yeah, yeah, especially um, on our celebrity class yeah. or whatever. And so it's funny because at one point it's it it was kind of curious in our band even because you know we have you who's born and raised in Bedford Stuyvesant and then we had uh, um, Justin our keyboard player who was like an Irish guy living in a who's just moved out to Bed Stuy because Bed Stuy had a good now had a good coffee shop and now had a good and what's really great about this book the gentrification of the mind is it really talks. About coffee shop and what the coffee shop represents it represents bad news for the people who live there because it's the beginning of a of a change you know it's a it's an interesting um but you know so we had we had uh we had we had we had justin living in your neighborhood you living in your neighborhood and you representing the people who've lived there all their lives and who are being somewhat i guess you know moved in upon approached upon by, by the kind of young white Upwardly mobile, you know, professional class. So it was, it, even within our band, there was a very interesting dynamic going on, you know. And Justin's a beautiful yeah. guy, in his mates' flat. Interesting conversation to be having. I take Justin on gigs with me here. That uh, it won't, and on my gig, there's a, there's a an African musician from Rwanda, and uh, he plays. And um, I was able to get Justin on one of the gigs, and. You know, he likes Justin. You know how Justin is. Sweetheart. And plus he gets whatever you like, you know, in a nice, he's got a calming way. And he's very well taken. And, you know, so is Eric and the Trent, you know, a German drummer and fitting so comfortably, like, you know. Yeah, I, I even had a little song. You're talking about the whole thing, the coffee shop. I had, like, um, Girls, dogs, coffee, coffee, dogs, girls, you know, because it's just like girls, dogs, coffee, because that's like what's happening around here, the girl with the dog going to the coffee, coming back with the dog, and, you know, I, I, yeah. I hope it wasn't mean-spirited, but uh, yeah. oh, it was like a little thing that was passing in my head, because yeah. I heard it even oh. supposedly as, like real estate people are opening up coffee shops because they know that that's a, a further enticement. Yeah. It feels the deal, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but you know, um, again, to come back to that book, <laughs> that she spoke about. Coffee dogs, girl. Girl <laughs> dogs, coffee. <laughs> and I turned it to girls love. You know, but not any way it's going to get me in trouble. Yeah, folks. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, Curtis. Well, look. I tell you what. We could talk all night, and I'd love to. But, but I, I can see that the line is getting bad again. So maybe we'll uh, we'll we'll, oh, we'll call it a day. Come on. Mm. <laughs> are, you hear? Me? You say it again. Um, I was just saying that I could talk to you all night, but I noticed that. Line is going bad again. Oh. Curtis, maybe can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, would you would you would you tune to say goodbye? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Would you oh thank you, man. Thank you. Okay, great, great, great. Thanks. Thank you, I love it. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's starting to have those uh, those dead spots. Like now. No, I don't hear you. <laughs> I'll play something I played for my mother when she was, uh, when we started. My brother played the trumpet, and uh, me and him used to get together. Oh, Curtis, I. It, Is that visible stuff? Yeah, I don't know. We missed. Our, we missed all of the sound, and the the sound is way out. Bye-bye, Curtis. Bye.